All right, here we are, episode somewhere in the 30s of Meriwether's World. Uh, for those of you new to the show, my name is Dr. Mark Meriwether Vorderbruggen. I am the creator of the Foraging Texas website and cultural little tiny puddle. Also author of Idiot's Guide Foraging, uh, covers 70 easy to find edible plants big multiple pictures and if there's poisonous mimics where in north america you can find it there's maps and stuff like that so there will be links there uh first tonight's sponsor is uncommon bees uh without further ado let us go to the presentation Ignore the little blurb down in the corner about episode 31, June, because we're now in July, and like I said, this is somewhere uh, in the 30s. So we'll be, we, well, uh, for those of you who haven't seen this before, we already covered plants to help with uh, diarrhea, dysentery, and food poisoning. And then uh, we talked about plants to stop bleeding and treat infected wounds. We did not get through all the infected wound plants. Uh, we're going to finish those up tonight and then move on to pain. And then the future episodes will cover burns and insect bites. Now, I want to point out that these plants used for treating these illnesses are really kind of last case scenario sort of things. When you are out in the wild, you should have some sort of first aid kit with some gauze and some neosporin and know some basic first aid, you know, how to stop bleeding. Uh, some soap is good to wash out wounds to prevent the infection. Think of this if, as things if you're on a, a long adventure, like a, you know, a, a four or five day hunting trip, uh, backpacking the Adirondack, uh, sorry, the, uh, the trail. Suddenly I can't remember the, the big long trail, any of the big long trails really, because these plants we'll be talking about are not just Texas, they are found all across North America. Um, but really, they are a poor substitute to modern medicinal uh, medicines and gear. So please keep that in mind. Uh, if anything, think of this as stuff for when the zombies come and Walgreens is no longer there or some other sort of grid down situation long term. But generally, this is uh, modern medicine is better than these. Okay, a refresher on infected wounds. The main way to prevent infected wounds and to help treat infected wounds is to wash them out with soap and water, ideally clean water. And if possible, apply some sort of antibiotic salve to it. You want to change the bandages one to four times a day as the bandages become soaked with uh, the normal sort of fluids produced by wounds other than blood. If you are still bleeding, you want to keep the bloody bandage on there to help trigger the scabbing and the coagulation of the blood. But the lymph and the other dampness and pus and things like that, you want to take those off because keeping the wound relatively dry it will also help go a long way towards dealing with infections. All right, so we talked about plants. Now let's talk about the mushrooms that help with this because mushrooms are just a pharmacopoeia of medicinal properties. And one of the best ones for dealing with uh, infections, you know, antibiotic type mushrooms would be just the common turkey tail. This is found growing on dead wood all across the world, actually. The name turkey tail comes from the fact that it really looks like the tail of a turkey. It has this kind of arch shape or kind of a you know, turkey tail shape to it. If you look closely on the top side, it will have alternating bands of color. These colors can be red, green, blue, orange, purple, uh, you know, pretty much anything here. This is just one example in the picture. They can be all sorts of really you know vibrant colors they will be alternating though the, the the bands will look almost like the rings uh, growth rings on a tree and the bands on the top side will be alternating between fuzzy and smooth uh, if you feel the turkey tail between your fingers it will almost have a slight velvety feel to it and if you look really really closely you will see the bands alternate in fuzziness now when you flip the turkey tail over 
you will see that instead of gills, it will look like the lower picture here. This is a polypore mushroom, which means instead of gills, it has all sorts of tiny pores, tiny little holes. These things are almost microscopic. If you have good eyes, you'll be able to see them with your, your, your you know, no magnifying glass, but usually uh, magnifying glass will help tremendously. Now you do need to see these pores. There are some mimics that look more or less like this on the top and have the same shape, that art shape, the colored bands, thin. Oh, side note, these mushrooms, they're, they're thin like the cardboard from cereal boxes. If you find something, you know, a quarter of an inch thick, that's not a turkey tail. That's probably something else in the Termati's uh, family, but it is not the true turkey tail. So underside uh, is lots of microscopic or, or yeah, almost microscopic pores. They attach to the dead wood by just a thin little stem. So if my hand is a turkey tail, it's going to be attached you know, here just at the very base. Uh, this is very important also when you see some of the mimics, which I'll be bringing up pictures of the mimics here in a moment. Um, you need to be able to you know, see that it just has that little stem. And as I mentioned, it, it, they grow on dead wood, usually lots of them. Uh, in pretty good clusters on the dead wood. So that's the true turkey tail. Fuzzy bands of color, underside tiny pores, very, very thin, like cardboard from a cereal box, growing on dead wood. There are some mimic. Oh, uh, also, where are they found? Uh, pretty much all across North America. So anywhere there are lots of woods, because uh, they grow on dead wood, uh, you will very likely find the turkey tail. So if you see up here in the, the more uh, really northern regions of Canada, when you start running out of woods, it's just more open plain uh, or you know, barren tundra sort of thing. Uh, not a lot of place for the turkey tail to grow. So mimics. Uh, one of the common is the gilled polypore mushroom, Traumatis butylina. I believe it's it. Like I said, I, I'm always afraid of speaking Latin because I may you know, conjure a demon. So we'll just go with Traumatis betelu, betelu, Yeah, this one. You can read it here. Um, so the top side will look like the turkey tail, the true turkey tail, where it'll be a kind of, you know, that fan-shaped bands. The bands may or may not be fuzzy, but if you flip it over, it will look like the surface of a brain instead of lots of tiny pores it actually has gills on it so not really toxic um, the main thing with this it's in the same family as the turkey tail but for whatever reason it just hasn't been as explored as deeply medicinally so uh, you're not going to accidentally poison yourself with it but as far as fighting infections making a tea from this to wash out a wound uh, there's no guarantee it will work. So that is one mimic. And then the other is what's called the false turkey tail. Uh, I'm not even going to try and say that word, but again, from the top, it looks just like the turkey tail. But then if you flip it over, the bottom side is the same mushrooms, you know, on the same dead wood, uh, flipped over and instead of just attached to the wood at just a little, you know, little stem there, it actually forms a crust that then flips up and forms the turkey tail. So if you just see a big, long, relatively smooth crust on the underside and then it flips up into the turkey tail, that is the false turkey tail. If you look at it under a micros microscope, the underside, uh, there will be no pores there, so it'll just be a smooth crust. Uh, again, not poisonous, but the medicinal properties of this are um, pretty weak to, uh, to know. And I think what's going on, and you know, I'm not even going to guess, but there might be a different computer being brought in here any minute now. Nope. Oh, okay. Uh, moving on. So it's also going to be hard to answer any questions. So I'm just looking here quickly if I can see any questions. Okay, not very easily. Uh, yeah, so if anyone has a spare com 
computer. Hey, we could use a spare computer. All right, uh, how do you use the turkey tail, uh, the true turkey tail to fight infections? Well, you want to make a tisane out of it. If you remember from earlier shows, a tisane is what an herbalist calls a tea, you know, T-E-A, made from plants that don't have the official Sensinea tea plant in it. So think to say and just think a tea made from mushrooms instead of uh, the Sensinea, the, the traditional tea plant, Indian tea. So you'll take and boil a quarter cup of the turkey tail. Uh, so this should be in about one quart of water. So you want to make a, 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 a quart of this stuff. Let it cool down to a comfortable temperature and then use this to wash out the wound. You know, so pour it over, try and flush the wound out. Um, drinking it, the turkey, it'll taste good. It'll taste like mushroom gravy, but you really want to get the compounds that you extracted during, during the boiling process into the wound to flush it out and kill any bacteria that's in there. And you probably want to do this several times a day. So you don't have to use the entire quart over you know, one wound, maybe the first few days, or if there's signs of an infection growing, yeah, then you would use a quart of it maybe four times a day. Uh, usually you can get by with just a little bit. Uh, as usual, there is a link, and it will be posted uh, when we can, to some scientific research that looks into the medicinal properties, in this case, the antimicrobial, antibacterial properties of uh, the turkey tail. It's really, really a fascinating mushroom. All right, uh, just see if I can see anything here. If not, we're going to move on to the next, the next one, the hoof mushroom, uh, Fomus fomentaris, also known as the tinder mushroom. Um, this has uh, multiple uses. One of the non-medicinal uses of this is that it, the inner material of this, if you cut it open, the core material, once it's dried out, will actually take a spark from like flint and steel or rubbing two sticks together and allow that spark to grow and be used to convert, uh, make fire. It also has some really potent antibacterial uh, properties to it. Uh, which leads to a really another interesting fact that I, I, I think it's interesting. If you, it uh, has to do with what's called the OTZI, A -T, uh, sorry, O T Z I OTZI Iceman, which was a uh, early man found in a glacier up uh, in the mountains in Europe. And I forget how many tens of thousand years old, uh, no, maybe not tens of thousands, but it's like, uh, somewhere between, I think, 5,000 and, and 10,000 years old. And, you know, he was, uh, they could tell he was actually murdered or, well, he died from wounds inflicted by someone else. He had like an arrow stuck in his shoulder and so forth, but he was on the run into the mountains. Uh, and interestingly enough, in his bag, because all his, all of his gear was saved, uh, there were some strips of the hoof mushroom. And the question was, did he have it there for medicine or did he have it there for fire or did he have it there for both? Um, because even back then, there's other signs that this particular mushroom was used both for fire and medicine. So hoof mushroom. The top side, as you can see, it's gray with dark layers. So it grows multiple seasons, growing a new layer each time. And the, the layers... Uh, basically change between a dark brown red color and uh, a gray color. The underside is going to be white or off-white and again covered with tiny pores. So this is also uh, considered to be a polypore mushroom and being so it is found on dead and dying wood. So the turkey tail, the false turkey tail, the uh, guild polypore, uh, all those, uh, their purpose in life is to destroy dead wood, break it down so that the, you know, can, the building blocks can be used by something else. So you'll find these growing on dead and dying trees. 
uh, both hardwood and pine trees. Usually hardwood's a little more common. Uh, pine trees usually are pretty good at protecting themselves from this particular mushroom. Uh, in particular, birch trees. The stem where it's attached to the uh, tree, it's the entire back of the mushroom. So if this is the tree, this is the hoof mushroom, the entire back surface of that mushroom is attached to the wood. So you, you really have to like break it off or cut it off or a lot of times you'll just take a, a piece out of it. And like I said, found in dead and dying wood. So usually multiples. Here's a, a really good example of where we have multiple of these hoof mushrooms growing on a tree. The tree itself uh, had a mixture of dead branches and live branches. Uh, last time I checked, I haven't been there in a while, um, but I suspect it's pretty much all dead branches now. Next to it on the, well, my right, maybe your left, uh, you'll see the underside and the, the mushroom cut in half. Uh, so the white layer is the bottom of the mushroom. That's where the polypores, the tiny pores will be. And then that dark brown section, each one of those is actually a really tiny tube. Each one of those tubes running to a different pore. It looks like a, a dense mass. It almost looks like meat fibers. Like if you cut a steak open, you have all the, the just the meat fibers running through it. That's what that part looks like. And then above that, you have the uh, newer growth, sorry, the, the older growth, uh, the lighter brown stuff. That lighter brown stuff is the part that has the most medicinal properties. And also when dried out, will catch the spark to, to make fire. So really you, you don't want the gills or the pores or the, sorry, the, the pores or the tubes running uh, to the pores, you just want the upper flesh of the mushroom. Now, the nice thing about this one is there are no mimics really to it. Uh, it's like the name the hoof mushroom. It looks like the hoof of a horse. Okay, granted, horse hooves don't have those layers, but it has that slanted shape to it. I don't know how to describe it other than, look, it's, it's slanted and pyramidal, half pyramidal, half conal. There we go, half cone sort of shape. Um, okay, so like I said, the parts used are the upper part of the mushroom, uh, not the pores, not the pore structures, and you treat it the same way you do the turkey tail, where you take about a quarter cup of that upper portion, chop it up really fine. The more fine you can chop it, the more surface area that will be exposed to the boiling water, so the more the medicinal compounds you can draw from it. So the more finely you can chop it or your buddy can chop it, uh, the better the resulting brew. So you boil it, allow it to cool, and wash the wound out. So, um, and again, as usual, there will be the link. Oops, you know what? The, the, the links I was I can't put any links in now. I can't scroll. <laughs> no, we are having problems. Um, yeah, so they will be posted later on after the show. Okay, um, I'm going to see if I can scroll through and if there are any comments. But I don't really have the ability to do that. So type your, well, I guess you are typing your content, uh, your, your questions, and I will go through and answer them afterwards. Oh, wait, hey. Sorry, uh, now nah, I'm just gonna do it afterwards. Okay, so the next one, it's not a plant, not a fungus. It is a mixture of fungi and bacteria. Uh, lichens, in particular, the type of lichen that is referred to as the old man's beard lichen. This is in the Eusnea species or use it's it's hard to call it a species because a, a lichen is actually a symbiotic relationship of bacteria and fungi so it'd really be more of a eucinea kind of family or community but this is the particular fungus uh, sorry particular lichen that grows on uh, living and dead wood and it 
has like scraggly, almost tiny coral-like structure. So hopefully you can see the picture. And these are found all across North America, actually found all across the world. So I actually got some, some lines drawn here so you can see, because there's uh, two types of lichen on here. There is the folios type, which is just kind of like a, a leaf glued to the tree, and then the scraggly coral beard-like one. So the arrows are, are pointing to the scraggly old man's beard lichen. So it will be gray in color, grow in clumps. It'll be scraggly, and if you look closely at it, the strands will be kind of coral shaped where they'll kind of branch and have other branches coming off it. Found on live and dead trees. Now, being a lichen, they are uh, susceptible to, uh, or actually very susceptible to any sort of toxicity in the air like uh, airborne chemicals that are, are not good for things and it will kill them. So if you see a lot of lichen, that's a really strong indicator that the location, the environment in which you found them is healthy and clean because they can't handle the, the normal industrial chemicals. So seeing the, the lichens and in particular the old man's beard, it's a very good indicator of at least air quality. So the parts you use are the visible parts. So again, you can just kind of carefully pick them off the tree. If you get some tree bark, that's fine. It's not going to be a problem. But you want the what we call the aerial parts or the visible parts. You just pull them off. Uh, nice thing about this is you can use it in multiple different ways. Uh, the first way is you can make a poultice out of it. So you would take a, a wad of the old man's beard and chew it up into a pulp. The reason you're chewing it is because you're trying to rupture the cell walls so those medicinal compounds can escape. You know, they'll be in the saliva and in the juice. And then you take the wad and you slap it on the wound and wrap some gauze around it and call it good. Uh, you can also make a tisane out of it, same way we were doing it with the mushrooms, a quarter cup boiled in a quart of water. Uh, boil it 10 minutes, let it cool, and then just use it as a wash, you know, two, three times a day. More if there's a, a raging infection, like if there's, you know, actual signs of infection, you know, the bad smell, the pus, the black lines, you want to, you know, flood it like every two hours or so. Uh, and then also you can make a tincture out of it. So you can soak it in alcohol. But if you remember from last week, I really don't like applying alcohol to wounds uh, just because the drying action of the alcohol damages the healthy cells and slows down healing. Uh, so think of, you know, if you find a really nice clump of lichen that you can uh, take with you, you know, you can take it and take it home, make a tincture of it and use it at home or some, you know, keep it for real strong emergencies, you know, end of the world type stuff, maybe. Um, but though it works as a tincture, it improves it, the uh, ability above that of just plain alcohol. Uh, in the long run, it slows down, you know, the alcohol slows down the healing of the wound. Uh, again, in the picture here, I got the arrow pointing to the eucinea. And then on the lower corner, the folios type, which you'll see a lot. The folios type has some of the medicinal properties, but the eucinea, the old man's beard, has the highest concentration. So that's what you really want to find. Okay, so that was infected wounds. And let me just see here. Joseph has a question. What? Joseph has a question. Oh, okay. Where? Near the end. Uh, okay, so uh, Joseph uh, Ducote. Hey, Joseph. Uh, you're asking about bacterial or antifungal, too. Um, the turkey tail and the hoof mushroom are mainly uh, antibacterial. The less common reishi mushroom is also antibacterial and antifungal. But in the case of the turkey tail and the hoof mushroom, uh, a lot of times there will be multiple types of mushrooms on the tree, which is a strong indicator that the turkey tail is not killing off the competition the way the reishi does. 
So the, uh, the fungal infection, yeah, the turkey tail, it might be a little bit useful and better than nothing, but uh, it's mainly antimicrobial, antibacterial. Okay. All right. So now let's move on to pain relief. Uh, plants that will help, uh, that have been shown to scientifically help soothe pain. Uh, let's go with every internet fan's favorite one, the wild lettuce. Now, here is the disappointing news. So if you've been reading on the internet that wild lettuce has all these morphine components in it and is great for painkiller, well, actually, yeah, it is a very potent painkiller. The problem is the there's only one particular species of wild lettuce that has those opiates in it. That is the uh, Lactica verosa. And that is only found in two states wild in the United States. Um, so it's found in California and in Alabama. If you're looking in Texas or pretty much anywhere else in North America, you are out of luck. And we had a question from Uncommon Bees. So since they're the sponsor, I'm going to break and answer their question. How long can you store them? Okay, I'm assuming by them you mean the mushrooms. Uh, in general, stored uh, like in a vacuum sealed in the freezer, it'll be good for a year. If you just have them, you know, in a bowl on your counter, uh, which is generally a kind of a bad way of doing it, um, really, you know, maybe six to eight weeks uh, as a, you know, time and temperature and oxygen are damaging to medicinal plants and mushrooms. So the if you want to extend the time, you have to drop the temperature and take away the oxygen. So vacuum sealed in your freezer a year, maybe even a year and a half. Uh, as long as there's no sign of freezer burn, you're probably okay. Uh, but stored just on the counter, room temperature, things like that, they're not going to last as long. Six to eight weeks would be uh, as long as I would keep them around. Now, if you make a tincture out of it, the tincture has pretty much an, uh, you know, in, uh, not in, well, eternal, you know, it, it'll last, you know, a decade. It'll still be good. So that's kind of the benefit of tincturing. Now, the question is, not that you have a question, is I'm just, you know, rolling things through my head. Would turkey tail infused honey have a use? Because honey is a very potent antimicrobial. Honey is really cool. I'm just going to go sideways here for a second. Honey is loaded with all sorts of enzymes. And one of the things it does when it's applied to an open wound is it starts producing hydrogen peroxide, which is deadly to the, uh, the, the, the bacteria and other infectious uh, elements that could be growing in the wound. And it is also very, very drying. It very, you know, suck the moisture out of the bacteria and kill them that way, uh, along with the whole hydrogen peroxide thing. So honey is really cool. So I'm thinking like a turkey tail infused uh, honey, there might be something to that. Let's talk more. Just because I, I get like two or three emails a day about this, so I just have to break it to people. Whoops. All right. Now, the compound in the wild, you're going to have to deal with some chemistry here because it is pretty fascinating. When I was doing research on this, I just ended up down a rabbit hole for hours because it was so fascinating. The active ingredient in the painkiller is called lact uh, lactosin, and it is a electroisomer of morphine. So while technically it's not exactly a true opiate, it kind of triggers the same sensors as far as I could tell. They're the same chemical pathways and has the same sort of effect. Uh, so very, very potent. Uh, it's mainly in the sap. So the part used is the sap. Uh, the way they do it is they'll put little cuts in the uh, Lacta Verosa, let the sap weep out, collect the sap either that later that day or the next day, and then collect it in a jar. And then when they want to use it, they'll make a, a tea out of it, the tisane, where they just you know dissolve it in hot water. 
uh, or you can dissolve it in alcohol if you want a shelf stable uh, pain relief sort of, of product. Um, so the tisane then you would drink. The amounts is where it gets tricky because being a wild plant, it has not been bred for a consistent uh, concentration production of the pain killing molecule. And so the basically the recommended uh, practices start with like a, a quarter teaspoon in a, a cup of hot water of the of the sap and just see what happens. Uh, so uh, you kind of have to vary and play with it some. So it's that's where it becomes more of an art and witchcraft rather than science because you don't know how much of the actual active ingredient is in the sap. Uh, one thing I can tell you <laughs> is if you overdose, uh, the signs that you have too much, it will be a mixture of dizziness, nausea, anxiety, and breathing issues. So if you start to get dizzy, if you start to get really nervous and upset, you start to have problems breathing, you have just overdosed on wild lettuce and you probably want to seek medical help or at least just be... Uh, let me do one thing here. Sorry, I'm just deal with me for a second here. Because we need to... There. Okay. There you can see this. All right. So uh, as far as a good starting point for learning more about the wild lettuce, uh, the link will be posted there, the healthline.com type thing. It, it leads to all sorts of interesting research. And doing some more uh, research into it, you can actually buy the seeds. There are a number of sellers on Amazon. And I put a link to the one that has the best, uh, uh, best number of reviews, the highest reviews of fast act or, uh, healthy seeds, germinate, scent quickly, that sort of thing. It's getting a little late in the season to try growing it, but you can sprinkle the seeds in the fall and they will start coming up in late winter. Um, Considering it grows in California and Alabama wild, I suspect at least in Texas it should do well here too. So if you want to grow it, um, you could probably grow it here in Texas. Uh, another thing you need to keep in mind, uh, and I, I found different uh, articles on this, so I don't know what happens if you've been taking the wild lettuce for pain and you are called in at work to do a drug test. Uh, there's some indication that it might trigger a, you know, give an indicate that you are on some sort of contraband opiate. And there's other things that say it won't. And I have not been able to get enough information yet on likelihood. So being the cautious fellow that I am, and one that gets very routinely tapped for drug tests, my advice is to not use it if you are uh, in a situation where you maybe uh, have to do a, a, a random drug test, so at work or an athlete or for some other reason, military, whatnot. So keep that in mind. Terry, mm -hmm. uh, what it agrees. Okay. <laughs> they should leave it alone. Oh, yeah. All right, next up is yeah. the willow tree. Again, this is the, the silex species, your weeping willows, your, your swamp willows, not the desert willow. We talked about that in an earlier show. That's not a true willow. But the true willows, the silex species, found all across North America. Uh, that, oh, and let's, let's talk about uh, what it looks like. Whoop. Jan Lowe does grow going back to the other plant you're talking about, I'll grow it easily and uses it for many, has used it for many years. Oh, cool. So, and I know she's here in Texas. So yeah, there's no reason it shouldn't grow here. It's just that the seeds haven't you know shown up here. The wild lettuce, that particular species of wild lettuce is not native to North America. It actually came from Europe where it was used both as a food and as a food source but it never really took hold anywhere except the California and the Alabama. Um, I don't know why, if it was a cultural thing or, or what. So, but uh, I trust Jen on that for it growing here. 
Uh, anything else here? Okay, Chris, oh, Chris Bedford has used Willow. All right, so for those of you who don't know a willow tree, just again, you know, these are the big, weepy, long, spindly, somewhat messy trees. The leaves are long and slender. They have pinnate veins. If you remember, the pinnate vein is where it has one center vein, and then all the other veins come off that center vein. I always say, think of a Christmas tree with this. The stem of the Christmas tree is the center vein, and then all the branches are the secondary veins coming off that center trunk. The leaves are alternating, so they kind of zigzag along the, the trunk. The bark is going to be smooth and green-yellow to gray when it's young. So especially at the ends of branches, it'll be very smooth. Uh, but an old trunk, you know, especially at the base, can be quite craggy and almost peeling. The willow trees are found just about every wet area along streams and lakes and ponds and even ditches. They definitely love and need lots of water, so you will look for them in wet areas. So the part you use is the young inner bark, so not the outer bark. You have to peel that away and get the living, the cambium layer, that first layer of wood that makes each year the growth ring. That living layer of wood is what you want. You want to take that up. Uh, ideally, uh, usually the, the traditional way of harvesting it is during the winter from last year's uh, branches. Um, so the leaves have dropped off. You take a branch about the size of your pinky and peel the outer bark away and then just shave the inner layer bark off it. Uh, you want about one teaspoon per cup of water. Boil it for 10 minutes. Uh, you can see it actually turns a really interesting red color. And the flavor is somewhat reminiscent of wintergreen. Uh, those of you who have ever chewed an aspirin or uh, otherwise you know, drank an aspirin, something like that, would expect the willow tree, to the, the, the tea made from it, to have an aspirin sort of flavor. Because the original aspirin was molecules taken from the bark of willow tree. Oops. Mm, Jan's got another comment. Uh, yeah. Okay, so Jan mentions that she actually started the seeds in the greenhouse during the winter and then uh, moved them outside. One of the nice things, if you are you know, growing your own, uh, it's only going to be pollinating itself. So over time, it's going to be you know, kind of become fairly consistent in the dosage. So uh, that's useful. All right, so tea made from the boiled inner bark of the willow tree. Now, warning, you do not want to give this to children under 16 because what you have here, when you drink it, will chemically turn into true aspirin. Well, acetosilicilic acid. Uh, and for the same reason, you are not supposed to give children under the age of 16 aspirin because it can lead to that Ray's Barr syndrome. Uh, which can be quite devastating. Uh, you don't want to give them the willow tea because it will can possibly trigger that same thing. Because in the end, the molecule in the aspirin and in the willow bark is the same. So let's talk about the molecules because you know I'm a chemist and I love this sort of thing. So the first one you see there, the salicin, that is the molecule that is in the willow bark. So that's what you're taking out there. Now, when salicylin hits your stomach acid, it gets split, it gets hydrolyzed, it gets acidified, and becomes salicylic acid. And the salicylic acid is the thing that does all the pain killing, the fever reduction, uh, the swelling going down, all that sort of thing. Now, true aspirin is acetosalicylic acid, aka aspirin, and what that is is on the far end here, they put a protecting group on the, they basically took the hydrogen from that top center part of the salicylic acid and replaced it with some molecular shrubbery. The reason they did that is it uh, reduces the initial uh, stomach distress that the true willow bark, you know, the salicin turned into the salicylic acid, causes. So you will be taking care of your headache and other pains, but if you drink a lot of the aspirin, 
uh, sorry, a lot of the willow bark tea, the salicylic acid being you know, a very potent acid, uh, will start to give you an upset stomach. So Bayer, the German company Bayer, figured out that if they take salicylic acid, attach this extra shrubbery to it, uh, it doesn't cause quite the stomach distress that the salicylic acid will. But between a headache and a minor upset stomach, I'm going to go with the minor upset stomach. So the willow, you know, the salicin in the willow bark gets converted to the salicylic acid, which does all the, the pain relief and fever relief and all that. Chemistry is cool. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I already talked. Do you want to make a tea from it? Just again, one more time. Uh, one teaspoon of the bark, the shaved inner bark, uh, in one cup of water, boil about 10 minutes. Again, the finer you can chop it, this is me like chopping stuff. The finer you can chop the bark, the more salicin you'll be able to extract from the wood and the more potent the aspirin will be. Like I said, the, the flavor is slightly wintergreen. It's, it's not what you would expect when you're thinking aspirin because it really doesn't taste like aspirin. All right, uh, whoops. Mm. Okay, it looks like we're kind of getting some posting type stuff here. Okay, um, any questions? Or... Not really. I okay. can't see yeah. anything. Okay. All right, next up is the white prickly poppy. This is more of a Texas... Uh, southeast and heading kind of up into the Midwest, Eastern Midwest states. Uh, I know here in Texas, this is kind of a springtime plant. Uh, like when uh, spring break rolled around, we drove from Houston up to San Antonio and the ditches and stuff were just lined with tons of the white prickly poppy. So this particular plant, the leaves are deeply lobed and at the same time, the edges are serrated. So the leaves you know, go deep in, deep in, and then the edges are you know, saw bladed. So sharp, spiky, uh, serrated edges. They do have the pinnate vein structure, again, so a central vein with all the other veins coming off it. And they alternate on the stem. Uh, also interesting about the leaves is the veins themselves are traced in white. Sometimes people mistake this for the milk thistle, especially when it's young. Um, but the milk thistle grows in a rosette and doesn't have the deeply lobed serrated uh, leaves that the white prickly poppy does, whereas the prickly poppy has the, the deeply, lobed la uh, deeply lobed leaves and the veins are a white color. The stem is going to be round and uh, green and covered with tiny prickers. Actually, they're not that small, almost like rose thorns. Hence the name prickly poppy. It is a very pokey uh, kind of plant here. The flowers, when they open, they are six petals. Though true botany terms, there are three petals and three identical sepals. Uh, if they're all on the same plane, they're petals. If they're on different planes, the higher one is the petal, the lower one is the sepal. But most people look at this and go, oh, six white petals. Um, but you'll see that they kind of overlap. They'll be surrounded by a cluster, or in the center will be a cluster of the yellow stamen. That's the male part of the, the plant that produces the pollen. And then in the very corner, in the very center, there'll be a small collection of purple uh, pistils, pistils, I, I have no pistils. idea how to pronounce that word. But pistils, like. Pistils, like, oh, okay, I guess I do know how to pronounce spelled that word. Spelled differently, though. Yeah, spelled differently. Uh, and then the size is about four inches across. Uh, bright, sunny fields, dry areas is where you will find these. So in big open clearings in the woods or, uh, you know, out, uh, not in the woods so much. They're, they don't really like shade. They want full sun is where you'll find them. So as you're coming across mountain ridges or through valleys that are free of trees is where you would find this. All right, as far as usage, the parts you use are 
all above ground parts. So you leave the roots in the ground, but the stem, the leaf, the flower buds, the flowers themselves are all ground up into a mash, uh, which is then boiled to make a tisane, or you can make a long-term tincture out of it where you soak it in alcohol. Uh, for the tisane, again, go with about a teaspoon of the plant material in a cup of hot water. Uh, you don't want to boil it when you're dealing with soft plant type material. You just want to what's called steep it, S-T-E-E-P, steep it in hot water. So bring the water to a boil, take it off the fire, let it cool for a bit, put your plant material in it, cap it, let it soak for you know 10 minutes to 30 minutes. Strain out the plant material, drink that, and it will have some very potent pain relief. Uh, there's some really interesting research going on now with this particular plant. Uh, it was originally used uh, by the Native Americans uh, where it was grown, and for a long time it was just kind of poo-pooed as, nah, it probably doesn't work, but more recent research really shows some cool uh, sort of stuff. Uh, side note, so how do they test scientifically test the pain properties or pain relieving properties of a plant. And it basically involves a live mouse and a hot plate. So they'll give the mouse a dose of the, the plant material scaled to the, you know, the, the proper dose for the size of the mouse. And then they have what's called paw avoidance. They put them on a, 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 a hot plate that's you know, kind of just a little too warm for the mouse and they time how long it takes it and, you know, how often it lifts its paws uh, from the plate. And then the theory then is if the uh, material is blocking pain, the mouse doesn't lift its, its paws as quickly and as, as often. So it's an interesting test, but that's how they, they test the scientific properties uh, the, of painkillers is you know, how long will a mouse keep its foot on a hot plate? So kind of interesting. Oh, uh, similar to the wild lettuce. Uh, this also, the molecules involved here, and I'm not gonna go into detail because they're, they're bigger and complex, um, but these are opiate style molecules. They will register on drug tests as an opiate and uh, if you overdo it, you will have the same sort of uh, dizziness, nausea, anxiety, breathing issues. Uh, also constipation, something to add. Um, so again, this is something you know for uh, pain that you really have no other way of dealing with. And again, if you're subjected to drug tests, you probably want to avoid this. Okay, last one is the prickly ash, also known as the tickle tongue, also known as the toothache tree. And these are pretty much all across the central and eastern part of North America. I'm not sure why they are not found in the western part, especially in California. I, I thought I had seen some in the past, but they might have been like display samples or something like that. But the, the uh, xantho, xantho, xanthoxylum species, and there's quite a few. These things are actually found all over the world. But uh, in Texas alone, there are four different species. But as you go across the central and eastern part of North America, you'll find a number of others. But they all do have oops, uh, very similar structures. So first, the leaves. The leaves are what are called compound where the stem of the leaf then has multiple leaflets coming off it. It can be difficult for a novice to tell the difference between a simple leaf and a leaflet on a compound leaf. And the trick is you gotta look really, really closely where the leaf or leaflet is attached to the stem. If there is a definite seam there, that is the leaf. If it just blends smoothly into the stem with no steam, that is a leaflet of a compound leaf. Uh, I've been trying to get some really good pictures to, 
to, to show it what I mean, but I've been having problems with that. But the leaves in this case are compound, so you'll have this long stem and then a bunch of leaflets on that stem, and at the leaflets will just blend smoothly into this into that center stalk, and then that center stalk will have a definite seam where it attaches to the wood. Pinnate vein, so the Christmas tree, uh, they can have either an intact or a serrated edge. Serrated is toothy, intact is where it's just a smooth line, and that depends on the particular species. The leaves, the compound leaves, will alternate on the stem, and also, and there'll be another picture of this, at the junction of the leaflets on the leaf. So the compound leaf with the leaflets on it, there will be thorns where the leaflets are attached to the center stalk of the leaf. Comment. Oop, comment. Uh, it is growing down the highway at Devil's Sinkhole Natural Area. I'm assuming, okay, yeah, prickly ash. This is growing everywhere. The, uh, the road, you know, like if you take 290 out of Houston, heading towards Austin, all along it is loaded with uh, toothache trees all over the Sam Houston, all along, it's, it's everywhere. Uh, once, if you go to the Foraging Texas website, you can see multiple pictures and full pictures of the tree. It's not a tall tree. It rarely gets probably above 18 feet tall. Uh, and it's very round and has a very distinctive silhouette and leaf structure. It's a very open tree. Once you recognize it and train your eye to see it, you're gonna see it everywhere. Uh, the berries, it produces clusters of berries. The berries are small, not much bigger than a kernel of popcorn, but they're plentiful. It'll produce lots and lots of clusters, kind of arranged almost like grapes, but a little more roundish ball. Uh, in the spring, the, the uh, berries will be kind of green and speckled. Uh, they will ripen to a red color and then they will split open with a black seed visible and that black seed will fall out. We just passed the seed dropping season. You might still be able to find some prickly ash with the uh, seeds on it, but it might be a little late. But you will still see the, at that point, the, the husks from the berries will still be on that grape cluster and they'll be split open and turning somewhat brown. Whoops. Two oh, toothache tree seed challenge. Uh, there's and number Jill. Whoops. Uh, yep, Jill. Okay, yeah, uh, Jill mentions making a tincture out of her toothache and that's actually what we want to talk about uh, when we get to the how to use it part. Uh, so the pain relief, oh, also finally the, the stem itself is going to be, well, the older, lower part of the stem will have these big, huge, triangular spikes. Uh, a particular species of, the, species of this is referred to as Hercules Club because it looks like, you know, the trunk looks like something you could just beat someone to death with medieval weapons sort of way. And then as the younger branches, those, those spikes turn into more like rose thorns. So they're still strong prickers. The part you use is the leaves and the inner bark. And for pain relief, it is mainly used for oral pain. So if you had a tooth knocked out or are out in the middle of nowhere and be, uh, uh, develop an abscess or develop a cavity or break a tooth or something like that, you start chewing on the leaves or on the inner bark, it's going to taste terrible but it actually has a, a Novocaine-like molecule that will numb uh, at least that section of your mouth, and it will stay numb for a little while at least. It will give you some relief from the pain. Like I said, it's going to taste terrible, but it will offer pain relief uh, in the poultice, poultice chewed up form, uh, areas where you have a lot of soft tissue with lots of blood vessels near the surface. So mainly the mouth, and one or two areas, other areas on the body, depending on uh, you know, your, your sex. <laughs> so uh, just something to keep in mind. Normally it's used for uh, extreme mouth pains. It, it really does work like a shot of Novocaine. Also a tincture of it, uh, like if you gargle with it, that will work to relieve the pain. There's also some really interesting 
uh, research showing that the inner bark in particular, an alcohol tincture of the inner bark, uh, is really good for rheumatoid, uh, rheumatoid arthritis type pains. So that's cool, and that article will be up there. Oops. Uh, oh. Okay, so Jill says, my grandkids think that tingling is funny. Yeah, it's a very common practical joke to play on people. It's like, oh, you got to try this leaf, you know, chew on it a bit. And they start chewing on it. And suddenly it's like you're chewing on aluminum foil. You get this weird tingling sensation. And then your mouth goes numb. And then Jan has a comment. Okay. Uh, Kratom, uh, since Kratom doesn't grow in the wild around here, I'm not bothering with it. Like I said, this particular one was, or this, tonight's episode was pain relief that you can find out in the wild while you're out adventuring. Um, so maybe at some point I'll talk about uh, Krantum, but uh, not tonight. Okay, wow, it is already 9 o'clock. So uh, at this point, uh, I'm going to let you get back to your lives. So I'm going to have to go through and check all the comments and try and fix that. Um, yeah, the, the, the computer that is used for the co-host, it's from 2013, and it's just not doing well. Yeah. Um, so anyway, at this note, I am going to sign off and, uh, we will see you later. Thanks for watching.